Yeah, I guess I'll call you Keith if, if that's okay. But um, that's great, sure. Really excited so, to. Uh, you are Matt and uh, John. John. John on the left, Matt on the right. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, I was uh, doing some research last night on um, you know the kind of things that you're studying, and uh, I'm really fascinated by it. And I think it's especially relevant to what John and I are trying to do with this uh, this network on YouTube. Um, you know, trying to give enough freedom to all the individuals so that something larger emerges. Um, so you describe yourself on your blog as a, sort of a scientist of, of creativity. Um, maybe you could go into a little bit uh, of detail as to what exactly um, creativity is. I mean, is this, is this a function of the human mind or is, does it have wider, um, does it have a wider, um, or is it, is it more widespread in nature in general? Or how do you go about um, you know, defining creativity? Ah, that's a great question. And it, uh, it could have a complicated answer, but I'll try to give my own simple answer. Uh, I define creativity as it has to be something new, uh, and it has to be a combination of existing things because there's no such thing as something completely new to the world. So it's new and it's going to be a combination of existing material. And uh, my third feature of creativity is that it has to be expressed. It has to be expressed outside your mind in some form that uh, people can view or consume or interact with. So I guess that's three things, a new combination that's expressed in some form. Right, so the expression component, that would mean it's uh, creativity is almost inherently uh, about a group, right? It's uh, or it's about, at least it's maybe in some sense about communicating, communication. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I like to exclude from my definition ideas that stay inside a person's mind right. and never get made into anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might think of uh, your dream, the dream you had last night, you might think, wow, that was a really creative dream. Uh, but uh, I guess I'm excluding that dream from my definition because it never gets expressed in the world. Right. Uh, Keith, in your book, I was reading about some of the uh, individuals who came together to promote such uh, a group genius, like J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, his roommate, the one, the guy that wrote *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, *The Chronicles of Narnia*. C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. That's right. Um, it, in your studies, it, is it just you come? Are you coming across many, many examples of? this is what happened and I'm just noticing a pattern or is it just something completely different each time uh, or is it a balance of both? I wanted to see, see what, what you observed from your, from your research. Uh, yeah, that's a good question and I'm glad you brought up that example. Uh, I make a pretty strong claim in my book, uh, Group Genius, that uh, this uh, idea that creativity comes from a solitary individual, the, the legendary lone genius, I claim that's a myth and that just about every time you hear a story about someone being a solitary creator, that it's a false story. And if you do a little bit of digging and you look up the real history, you'll always find collaboration and conversation and social networks. So this happens over and over again in my own research. Uh, and you know, when I go out into the public and I give talks and uh, often get a question from someone in the audience who will say, well, what about Albert Einstein, wasn't he a lone genius? And it turns out, no, he wasn't either. So there are many stories of these famous legendary creators that we hear. Uh, and over the course of the years, I've gradually, one by one, have uh, uh, had to dig under the surface uh, just for my own, to prove it to myself, really. And yeah, exactly like you say, it's a pattern that I find over and over again that there always is some interaction, some, uh, some substantial interaction. I call it collaboration. In the case of a novelist, someone who writes a book, uh, you know, that's a great example because many people think that writing is the most solitary type of creativity you could imagine. Yeah. Uh, and of course that must be a lone genius. But even something like writing a novel, you have Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and several other professors at Oxford sitting around in a pub once a week and batting around ideas about mythical creatures. Sounds like fun. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. in, in uh, reading some of your um, the papers that you've published last night, 
uh, you know, it strikes me that there's a, a sociological background to this idea that creative genius is, first and foremost, a collaborative effort. Um, and you've written a lot about uh, the French sociologist, Emile Durkheim, and his idea that there is some sort of uh, um, emergence of a society that is greater than any of the individuals um, separately. So maybe you could go into a little bit of why that idea is important for the um, the sort of context that you're trying to put creativity in and taking it away from the sense of a, you know, a sole individual genius and making it more of a collaborative effort? Absolutely. Uh, and you're right. I have been heavily influenced by sociology, um, my, even though my doctoral degree is in psychology. Mm. And I'm known primarily as a psychologist who studies creativity. But my own uh, research I focused on improvisation, improvisational groups like jazz ensembles or improvisational theater groups. And as I was trying to apply the psychological methods to the study of these groups, uh, it, it seemed to be missing something. It seemed like so much of the creativity was not taking place inside one performer's mind, but it seemed to be taking place uh, in between people. So that's when I felt myself turning to sociology and reading, uh, you know, classics like Emile Durkheim from 100 years ago, and also more contemporary writings by sociologists. And the question they're asking is, what's the relationship between the individual and the group? And that's the same question I was looking at. What's the relation between an individual performer's creativity and the creativity, the creativity of the whole group? So yeah, I think that's where sociology comes in. I guess for me, I try to bring together sociology and psychology. To right. come up with a more complete picture of group creativity. That's very interesting. Um, talking about the individual performer and the collaborative group genius, um, we've been watching a lot of John Stewart and Colbert lately. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you watch them, but if you have, I would like to get your take on how much do you feel is individual performer and how much is actually going on behind the scenes, like the group genius, the writers, the whole network of people uh, to put on, put on such a performance. Do you think it's more of the individual or more of the group, or, or, or is, it, is it they just have worked out the balance to the force kind of thing? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I, I'm not an expert on either of those shows, although I do watch them and I enjoy them. But my understanding of how shows like that are produced is that there is a, a fairly large staff of comedy writers yeah. who put together material for each night's show. Uh, collaboratively. I mean, you know, it's not like a corporation. They're not going to have a hundred people in the back room <laughs> working yeah. on ideas for Interesting. Colbert, but then I don't know the number. They probably have something between five and ten. An, uh, an, sorry. Um, what, one more thing about your book. Um, I was reading about some of the darker aspects of group genius. It's more of like group mind, group herd mentality. Did you Could you speak about that? Because a lot of times People want to just um, swift under the carpet, the darker sides, the shadow elements of such a such an endeavor. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, you mentioned Emile Durkheim. So 100 years ago, when uh, French sociologists first started looking at groups, they mostly viewed groups as uh, problem problematic. They, yeah. they were thinking about mobs, unruly crowds, uh, um, sort of uh, fads, fads that come and go. And it seems like when you have a bunch of people, thousands of people in the street, that you know normally sensible people could come together and turn into an angry mob and start you know lighting cars on fire or breaking yeah. windows. Yeah, we've seen that so, here. Yes, yeah, so it does seen. seem there's this phenomenon that uh, these the French sociologists were actually worried about this, the seeming uh, the the group becoming stupider <laughs> than, yeah. than the individuals in the group. So yeah, I have a chapter in my book where I, I talk about the group mind hypothesis, which comes from a book, 1972, that uh, coined the term group mind. And the book was about government decisions that were famous mistakes, uh, and uh, also in the United States government. One example in the book is the Bay of Pigs invasion. So there's a whole chapter where they analyze, you know, the people in Kennedy's administration in the early 1960s were all incredibly smart people and very highly educated, uh, and yet they collectively came up with this uh, failed plan, yeah. which in retrospect, most people agree was a pretty bad plan. So, 
something about the end.